sit in as well. So, so let's just jump right into this. Uh, the, it's, uh, as I told you earlier, when I first uh, became enmeshed in the clinical realities of dealing with diabetes, it became very evident to me that to call myself a lifestyle medicine doctor, I needed to be, I needed to be an expert at understanding all the underlying drivers and causes of diabetes and how, how to help people reverse, not, not manage, but reverse diabetes. Because when you're managing something, you're actually accepting it as the, something that you're gonna have for the rest of your life, and you're just managing, managing risk factors, which, uh, which typically in this case just means managing blood sugars. And as I pointed out earlier, major studies have documented that if all we do is manage blood sugars, we're way off the appropriate journey. We're not doing the right thing. So you, you can, you can uh, um, artificially, is a good word here, you can artificially lower your blood sugars, but that doesn't mean that you're actually healthier. Okay, and so that, that's maybe a whole new way of looking at this. Say so it's how you lower your blood sugars is everything. Okay, so, so I remember running into, a, not a patient of mine, but there was somebody that was waiting to see one of my colleagues who was an internal medicine physician at, at our wellness center. And um, uh, this was in Guam, and, and he was waiting to see the internist, um, a good friend of mine, and, he, and uh, somebody said to him, a friend of his said to him while I was present there in the, in the, in the office lobby, he said, hey, you, sh you, should, you should actually join this lifestyle medicine program, uh, then you could, you could you know, reverse your diabetes. And he looked at me and said, why? He says, well, that's what medicines are for. Why would I want to, why would I want to change my diet when we got medicines? I mean, you know, we're we in the 21st century here. Let's just, let's just take some medicines. Well, again, the Mayo Clinic has made it really clear that if, that if we buy in to that perspective, which unfortunately is standard perspective, that uh, you know, as long as we're kind of controlling our hemoglobin A1C and our fasting blood sugars with medication, that we're okay, we're actually increasing our risk of premature death in a dramatic way, and then increasing our risk for everything else in a dramatic way. And that's the key point that we want to address tonight so how can we use these principles, even if we don't have diabetes, even if we don't have pre-diabetes, uh, and, and reverse whatever personal risk that we have? So let's just jump right into this. So the, the, as I suggested earlier, treating diabetes and reversing diabetes is really the tip of the iceberg, something that I spent decades working on. But as I've understood, especially in the last five years, the, the key issue is addressing the burden of disease, the burden of health risk that constitutes the part of the iceberg that you can't see because it, it lies, it rests under the surface of the water. And as you may know, the, 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 the part of the iceberg that's underneath, that's unknown, unknown to us, is about 80 to 90% of the problem. 80%, 80 to 90% of the mass of the iceberg lies underneath the surface of the water. That is what is represented by what we refer to as insulin resistance. Now, so let's, what, what is the cause of high blood sugar Primarily, it's insulin resistance. Now, most of us, I would say most of Americans actually have high blood sugars, but not at the time that we check our blood sugars. So, so the average American that is not diagnosed with any real problems, when do they have their blood sugars checked? Okay, if we... Those of us who go to the doctor on a yearly basis, very important to have our physical, very important, well, uh, that physical will typically include what we call a comprehensive metabolic profile. That metabolic profile is very good. It has, it has over a dozen independent tests on it 
that tell you how your kidneys are doing, how your liver's doing, your electrolytes, uh, is your calcium and potassium adequate, is it too low, too high, um, your, your sodium chloride, a, a whole bunch of tests, including kidney function, like I said, and it looks at a fasting glucose, should be fasting. Uh, so if you go into the lab some morning before breakfast, preferably before nine o'clock, then we have a fasting blood sugar to work off of. That is, at least historically, has been the only blood sugar that people ever get. And, and that is why so few of the individuals who have prediabetes, you never know it, until they've already developed complications. Literally 90% of individuals who have prediabetes don't know it. In other words, we, it's almost, I, I, I say, at least in medicine, that, that ex assume somebody's pre-diabetic until proven otherwise. Literally. Okay, and that, that, that actually includes even young people. Frequently, I, I, in my clinic, I've, I've seen seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds with advanced prediabetes. It's common. It's a common problem, but since we typically only check the fasting blood sugar, uh, we don't know. So, essentially, think about insulin resistance in this way. Um, the, the insulin is like the key that hooks up to an insulin receptor on the surface of the cell membrane of, of muscle cells, of liver cells in particular, and an insulin is a key that basically connects, and then if the connection is appropriate, if there's no resistance there, it'll literally be able to unlock that doorway so that the, the receptor clicks, the door opens, and sugar flows from the blood where it's building up, where we measure it, into the cell where the cell can utilize it for energy. So why would a cell, a muscle cell, become resistant to insulin? This is a real question now. Okay, so one, one answer here is covered in saturated fat. That's actually a good answer. That's, that's a, but actually, that's not, the, that's not the main answer I'm looking for. It's a good answer, though. Why would a muscle cell become resistant to insulin? So let's just, let's kind of um, uh, reverse engineer this. Okay, um, what is insulin doing? Insulin is trying to unlock that passageway, that, that tunnel, that, that doorway for sugar to move from the blood into the cell. And so, so why would a, a muscle cell say, I don't want any more sugar? Yeah, because it's full. It's got all the sugar that it wants and more inside the muscle, and so it's put in a moratorium out there to say, we're now officially resistant to insulin. We don't want insulin to work real good because we got all the sugar we want. In fact, we got more than we want. So they're blocking that. All right, so if that's the case, then what would be one of the, th there's several you know, answers or strategies to address that, but in terms of that aspect of insulin resistance, what's, what would be an obvious solution to, to begin to implement? How do you get a muscle to want more sugar? Exercise. Oh yeah, so we, so that's why exercise is so wonderful, and that's why, that's why I actually gave a handout to Pastor Phil just this morning that, that walks somebody through. All, the, all of you that are getting a blood test Sunday morning, next, not this Sunday morning, but the following Sunday morning, will get a handout that says, here, these are, some, these are some strategies we recommend. We recommend that you start checking your blood sugar one before every meal, and one or two hours after the beginning of that meal. Now, this is for those of you who are found to have um, uh, a, a borderline or high hemoglobin A1C, or any of those of you that already know, or suspect even, that you have 
it, potential problems with prediabetes, which remember, at least one out of two of us between 40 and 59 have a minimum of prediabetes. If you're over than 59, you have, you have a two out of three chance of having prediabetes. That's a 67% of us are pre-diabetic automatically if we're in, in the age group of 60 to 74. And if you're over 74, your, 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 your risk of being pre-diabetic is three out of four, 75%. That's right. so, so in other words, if you're not pre-diabetic, you're in a minority group automatically, okay? in a healthier minority group. So, so, the, so one of the simplest strategies, and I'm not saying it's the most important strategies, I would say that that what we eat ultimately is really more important, but, but who's choosing here? You know, who, who says, remember last night, for those of you who were here, the three pillars of, of, uh, of optimal health and healing potential are not necessarily ultimately the most important things, well, ultimately, but they are the three most important things that set the stage for the most important things so that we can be successful, okay? And, uh, with, with, with family dynamics and how we deal with people socially and our willingness to forgive and, and our attitude and how we feel and all those things don't just happen. It's not just a personality. It's based on how well we're doing the fundamental strategies. So, so back to the exercise question, what would be some reasonable strategies to literally reverse that resistance. How are we gonna know that? If we're checking our blood sugars before and one or two hours after uh, most meals. And this is, this is something that anybody, I recommend everybody should, should just experiment with. Okay, because, because if you do that, you will see after eating a specially sugary or carbohydrate rich meal, the refined carbohydrates, which is, you know, the status quo, right? That's what, that's what most of us eat. You know, we chow down on, on, on highly refined carbohydrate foods and, and we think nothing of it because what? That's what everybody else does and that's what maybe we've done all our lives and so we just assume this is okay. And, but how many of us have actually tested to see how that impacts our risk factors? Let me, let me tell you a quick story. Um, when I was, uh, when I was uh, working at, at the Guam Seventh Adventist Clinic, which is a large medical center, uh, over 400 employees um, on the island of Guam, I was there from all, all the way from 1994 until 2008. It was a wonderful 14 years of our lives. We raised our kids there on beautiful, you know, uh, island in Guam, and we traveled uh, Asia because we we're right there near Bali and Australia. So it was just a totally different experience very surreal now looking back eight, tw 11 years later that we actually had that experience because it's so different from where we are here. But um, while I was there, I was asked to actually teach a college course at the University of Guam. I taught, I taught classes at Loma Linda University, to, uh, at the School of Public Health, and the School of Medicine. And, uh, and so I said, hey, I'm spending most of my time working with patients who've already been diagnosed with major diseases. Wouldn't it be neat to actually work with college students and actually teach a, a wellness lifestyle medicine class where we weren't just talking theory, but we were actually doing the tests and helping people find out in their early 20s what was going on. Well, so one of the first things that we did, this was a very lab-driven class where I made sure that they were learning something practical. And we actually, I had my nurses come from our clinic and tested everybody's blood sugar level, the second week of the class, where they were told, bring in your favorite carbohydrate drink. You choose what that is. If it's a Coke, it can't, it can't be a diet drink, right? Because we're doing a carbohydrate stress test, right? And by the way, diet drinks, just so you know, are worse for you than regular sodas, okay? And, 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 uh, I, and I, can, I can certainly back that up with scientific literature. I've actually told my children, if we, if we, don't, we don't buy sodas ever, we don't bring them into the house, but, but when they were growing up, if, if we went to a party and everybody was drinking a soda, I said, well, you can have a little bit of regular soda, but if I catch you with a diet soda, there's gonna be problems when we get home. 
Because that's, that's how important that is to me. And there's a lot of reasons for that. You're actually more likely to gain weight on a calorie-free diet soda over time than drinking regular sodas, even though it has zero calories. Why? Because it has essentially a chemical in it that's drug-like that actually causes weight gain because of how it affects the metabolism. Just like many people have experienced weight gain from taking a hormone or some other drug that, that is prescribed to them for another reason, why would that cause weight gain? It's just a little pill that has zero calories to it because it changes the metabolism. And that's what diet sodas do. So I tell them, bring in your favorite soda, or if you're so advanced in knowledge about health and wellness that you don't drink sodas, bring in whatever carbohydrate drink you think is a healthy drink, and we'll test you based on that. The idea is get three to 400 calories of carbohydrates in, and then we test your blood sugar one hour later. And so my students were like amazed. So I, I, I literally told them, I said, I, I want everybody, and this was graded. If you don't bring it in, you get docked. Okay, so bring in a drink and bring in whether it's sugar cookies or something that's carbohydrate. And if you're never eating any sugar, then bring in, bring in, you know, bring in bread. You know, bring, bring in something that's carbohydrate rich and we'll check your blood sugars. So I, I wanted to make this practical because see, one, so a lot of patients say, well, yeah, I did that glucose tolerance test at the lab but they gave me this awful syrupy sugar drink. Anybody who's been pregnant and tested for gestational diabetes will know, oh man, that's really nasty stuff. And so I would never drink that. I go, well, you know what? Yes, you would, because that's the equivalent of a medium-sized soda at McDonald's. And, you know, and I, I think that most of us in this room would have to admit that at some point in our life, We've had sodas from some fast food place or, 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 or used sodas in some way. So we've all done it, and we've all probably enjoyed it as well, myself included. And so, so it's just equivalent to that. Just because it's super sweet because it's concentrated doesn't mean that we haven't done exactly that same thing. So, so I want to actually have people bring in what they are used to and compare that because that resonates to their real lifestyle. So to, to, to make the long story short, one of my, uh, actually, these are early college students, and we found, we found one-fourth of them had, had high blood sugars. 25% of them, these are, these are college kids, already had pre-diabetic levels of blood sugars or worse. And one of my, one of my students uh, was... Uh, Fairly, you know, uh, plump uh, young man. He's 24 years old. He was, he was working his way through the school of business, and he had to take this wellness class. It was one of the cognates that he had to finish to graduate. So he was a senior, and um, and so he, he he did the test. And uh, so I was explaining what all this meant, you know, at, you know, while we were talking about it. And about an hour into into the class, you know, they drew his blood. And he came up to me after the class and showed me the piece of paper. His, his blood sugar was 335. No clue. No clue that he had any health problems whatsoever. Yeah, you know, he was overweight, maybe, maybe uh, 50 pounds overweight. But hey, you know, who, who isn't, right? In, in Guam, that's, like, that's just like par for the course, right? And, and so that was no big deal. All of a sudden. All of a sudden, he starts thinking, man, Uncle Joe died after his amputation. Mom went blind because of diabetes. Dad had a heart attack because of his diabetes. And, you know, when you're 24 years old, the last thing on your mind is like, yeah, my parents, you know, they got health problems, but not me. I'm 24 years old. Well, that finger stick that afternoon at the University of Guam changed all that. That, that denial, was, he didn't think it was denial, he just, he just would have never imagined that he had out of control diabetes. And so I, I said to him, uh, Tom was his name, I said, Tom, you need to go see your doctor. He says, I don't got a doctor. I said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to bring a lab for him in two days when we meet again, and I'm going to have you get this lab done at the closest lab to your house. So we did a glucose tolerance test on him. He had, as I so strongly suspected, 
based on defined protocols, out of control diabetes. Now, what do you think happened to him? Do you think he just like, well, you know, you're going to have this problem for the rest of your life. You better get used to it. You're going to be on medications for the rest of your life. You just got to get used to it. Uh, no, no, he, he, because he was in that wellness program, that was at the very beginning of a 10-week program, a, a comprehensive lifestyle medicine, medicine introduction uh, to, to, for each of those students. And, and so we, we basically put together in our labs a comprehensive uh, fitness and wellness program. He told me, he said, hey, doc, you know, this is, uh, you know, I'm under a lot of stress. You know, my parents rely on me to, I'm going to be the main breadwinner because my parents can't work anymore. They're disabled with their illnesses. And uh, I got a lot of, a lot of uh, aunts and uncles have the same problem. And so now I find out, man, I'm, I'm like, I'm going to be right there with them in a matter of years. And I, that can't be. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a two-pack-a-day smoker. You know, and, and man, when I was in Guam talking to patients, I, you know, I've never drank alcohol in my life. And I'm, I'm really glad I never did because if I did, I would have really gone overboard because I, I kind of have addicted personality. I would like booze it up. But these, I had no idea how much people can drink. When one of my patients, I asked him how much he, drink, he drank, and he said two to three, I go like two to three cans? I'm like, no, two to three cases. And I, I didn't even know what a case was. So I said, you mean six-pack? And he says, no, no, cases. There's three six-packs in a case. <laughs> and, I mean, it still boggles my mind, but, but and, and you, you don't have to believe me, by the way, but this is, this is actually, there's a lot of people in Guam who actually drink that way. They will literally hang out at the pickup truck with their buddies, and they'll drink for four or five hours, and they can actually put down 50, 50 beers. Now, I... I couldn't drink that much water, you know, but, but, um, but, you know, he was just being honest with me, you know, he just, you know, he had some health issues, and so he wanted to be honest with me, and I, I, it, it was surreal to me, I never, I never imagined anybody could drink that much beer, you know, medically speaking, did you know this, that, you know what the definition of heavy drinking is? Heavy drinking, medically speaking, any more than two drinks in a 24-hour period. So people laugh at that, you know, because like, what? You know, every, you know, if somebody's drinking, they're going to drink more than two beers, right? But, or or two, two drink equivalents. But from a medical standpoint, that's heavy drinking. Why? Because heavy drinking is defined by what's, what's clearly bad for us. And we could talk more about moderate drinking. <laughs> In fact, I had debates at the University of Guam with pe the people I had no idea how I felt about it, and I'd have them debate whether, whether moderate drinking was better than not drinking at all. And, and, and I never influenced, I, I kid you not, I never influenced this argument ever as every time I taught the class. And every single time they debated this, because I, you know, I, the whole point of, of, of being able to be a good debater is knowing both sides of the argument. If you know the other side of the argument better than they do, you're going to win the debate. And you know what? Every single time the group that won the debate was the group that had, had, uh, had uh, basically randomly been assigned to, the, to argue the point of complete abstinence of alcohol. And, and one, one, late, one of the uh, college students uh, in the back of the room, she, she raised her hand after we discussed it, right? And that's when I present my case. I... Uh, uh, she raised her hand and says, you know, I'm a bartender at three bars in town. She says, I have never seen a moderate drinker. And so she said, this whole argument is mute. She says, there is no such thing. As a now, of course, I disagree with her, but that was her perspective, being a bartender. It's just that when people drink, you know, you're not necessarily, you know, thinking, well, I'm not just a moderate drinker. Anyways, uh, the, the, the bottom line is that he was, this 24-year-old this was drinking uh, heavily, uh, was, was smoking heavily, he was completely sedentary, he was stressed out, you know, uh, can we get some colder air? Does everybody get a little bit hot in here? 
I'm, I'm kind of noticing a little hand waving. You know, okay, so that, so uh, if possible, <laughs> if possible, if we could get a little uh, uh, more air in here, that'd be great. Um, so, good thing I have this on and not my jacket, right? I mean, I'd be sweaty. Uh, so, uh, so he, you know, and so I'm thinking to myself, man, you know, he's a college student. He's not going to want to do this. He's not going to want, and you know what? Because he went through that program and he saw the results of his own blood sugar test one hour after that, that, just, that simple soda that he had had a thousand times before, right? Or more than that, really. Um, that, that really affected him. That engaged him so powerfully in the program. You know, by the end of the 10-week wellness, it's just a class at the university, he had effectively stopped smoking, stopped drinking. He had lost 50 pounds in that period of time, and he had completely reversed his diabetes. So, so some people say, well, yeah, because he's 24 years old, he can pull that off. I've seen 90-year-olds do it, literally. In fact, right now I have a, I have a patient who's 96 years old. He's another multimillionaire, which unlike multi-multimillionaire, unlike the other multimillionaire I mentioned last night, basically decided he was going to do whatever was necessary and he was going to not deviate to the left or the right, and he did it. He was, it's, it's an interesting story. He was, he was so interested in diabetes, not because he was concerned about himself, but because he had a family member that had out-of-control diabetes. He was 89 years old at the time. He actually was chairman of the board of the publishing house that eventually published my book, Goodbye Diabetes, which was the precursor to the Diabetes Undone program as a comprehensive program like what we're talking about here. And, and uh, so he was literally harassing my publisher to harass me to write this book. And it took us five years. It took us five years. And so he was, Tom was his name. Tom was the, at 89 years old, he was the first one to get a copy of this book. And he read it. And he read it, and he was convicted. He says, he called me up. He said, Wes, you know, rough, you know, old voice. He said, Wes, I gotta, you, you got to do all these tests on me. I go, absolutely, Tom. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're the chairman of the board, right? Literally. And, uh, and so we, he came to my office. We did all those tests, lived in Laguna Beach. And, and, and then uh, before I went over the test with him, he, he goes like, now, Wes, he says, I, I don't want you to sugarcoat this for me. Okay, I want you to tell me, you know, just like a good chairman of the board, you know, he doesn't want yes people. Oh, yeah, yeah, I like your idea. Oh, yeah, yeah, go for it. No, he says, he says if, if everybody agrees with me on this board, I'm going to fire all of you and find some people that have some advice for me, right? So, 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 so just tell me like it is. And I said, Tom, I'm telling you, you have out of control diabetes. Your blood sugars at one and two hours were over 300 on that glucose tolerance test. He, and he, he kind of, he was sitting down already. You know, we had a kind of a boardroom where I meet with groups and my patients. And so he was there with his wife, and he was like, uh, he said, now come on, Wes, tell me. I'm, I'm telling you, Tom, you had out of control diabetes. And then he slammed his fist, his open fist on the table and says, What are we going to do about this? And I smiled and I said, Tom, I'm glad you asked. Okay, because I'm going to tell you everything that you can do. And, you know, I love working with a successful businessman. Anybody who's been is dramatically successful in any aspect of their life, any aspect, but especially business, they know what it takes to get the job done. You don't become a multimillionaire you know, uh, from nothing, there's literally nothing. He didn't, he grew up in a very poor home um, because you want a lot of money, because you wish you could do the right things. You become successful because you do what needs to be done and you keep working until it gets done. It's an attitude. And so I love working with people who already have that attitude and they're just saying, like, just tell me, just educate me, I'm going to do it. So one of the first things that I told Tom is that, you know, he didn't have a, he didn't really have a bad diet. 
you know, you don't have to have a bad diet to join the diabetes, the diabetes Undone program, okay? All you need is a desire to optimize your diet. He had an okay diet. He ate better than 90% of Americans, and he could have easily argued with me and go like, Wes, I'm already doing so much better than everybody else. Talk about something else. But he didn't do that. Why? Because he wanted to be successful, and he knew that he needed to be in a position of listening to the experts. So, um, so I showed him how to, how to pro-optimize a plant-based diet. I, I showed him how, in his case, he was his, one of his nemesis, one of his big challenges was that he, would, he loved woodworking, which is a great thing. And see, he would bring me all these kind of cool bowls from Hawaii, you know, from the special wood from Hawaii. You know, he, he had tons of money, so he'd buy this, this really expensive wood and do woodworking, right? And so he'd bring them to me. He's like, hey, here's a present for you and your wife. So I got tons of bowls in my house from, from Tom. And, uh, and uh, <clears throat> but then he'd do that, and he would not eat on a schedule. He just, you know, what's more natural than just eating when you're hungry? On the surface, it sounds like a real reasonable thing. Just eat when you're hungry. Don't eat when you're not. The problem is the body doesn't work that way. The body operates on circadian rhythms. Uh, what, why don't you just sleep when you're sleepy? Instead of going to bed at a, at a normal time, and uh, at, a, at a good time, and getting up at a good time, just sleep when you're sleepy. Um, have you ever heard the idea of follow your heart? <laughs> just follow your feelings. You know, like that Sprite commercial, right? Just, you know, uh, uh, follow your thirst. It sounds so natural, and it is natural, by the way, but is that healthy? It is the antithesis of healthy. If we follow our feelings, if we follow our heart, we're going to be in a lot of trouble really quick. You know, if the average person just did what they felt like, you know what would happen? They wouldn't be in a relationship very long, that's for sure. Okay? They wouldn't have friends for very long. There would be all kinds of problems, and we would basically, we would die very young if we did not learn how to effectively set limits. So one of the biggest goals for us is to become experts at setting limits joyfully, like I said last night. If we're good at setting limits, that means that we have allowed for what's best in what we can, how we can optimize our health. So, um, so bottom line is that Tom did all this, and one of the main things, one of the main reasons I'm telling you his story is because he learned about walking after meals. And so this is something that I challenge all of you to do, is check your blood sugars an hour or two preferably one hour after the beginning of a meal. This is for anybody, regardless of what your condition is. Just see what happens. Check before and after a regular meal. In fact, uh, splurge a little bit. Just, just eat, eat stuff that you might not think is the best for you, but, but something that you normally would eat. And then find out how high your sugar goes at one hour, and then add a 10 to 20 minute light walk after the meal before you check your blood sugar at one hour. And look at the difference. The higher our blood sugars are after a meal, because our predisposition towards prediabetes or diabetes, the more benefit we're actually going to get by doing light to moderate exercise, like, like, like a light walk, immediately after the meal. You can lower your blood sugars anywhere from one point to three points for every minute that you walk lightly after a meal. So, so with, for Tom, who is running over 300 points on blood sugar after a meal, for him to go out for a walk after breakfast would potentially lower his blood sugars almost 100 points, and that's just because of the exercise, and that's light exercise. Um, and then, once he learned the impact of that, we optimize the diet and balance it and no more snacks because that's what he was doing. He'd work, he'd work until about 8 o'clock and he'd go like, man, man, I, did, I forgot to have any dinner. So let's just make myself a, a nice big sandwich, a nice, quote, healthy sandwich. And so he was eating too late. He was eating at the wrong times. He was eating whenever 
rather than at, at distinct times that the body can be prepped for and be, be prepared for to be able to handle better. So, um, so essentially, uh, Tom says, you mean if I exercise after breakfast and maybe after lunch, that I, my blood sugars will really improve? I said, absolutely, they will. And his wife glared at me. She says, have you seen Tom walking down the hallway? He could hardly walk a straight line because he's got, he's got neurologic issues and he's, he's 89 years old. He's kind of weak. And so, and so I said, well, Vi, uh, that the good news is, is that if you walk with him, he'll probably be safer. She kind of glared at me. But you know what? They did it and they became the talk of Laguna Beach and that gated community above the bay. Um, they... Uh, they would go walking for 45 minutes every morning right after breakfast. They didn't walk very fast, okay, but, you know, 89 years old. And, you know, within, and then they changed their diet comprehensively, you know, within five weeks. He called me up before his 90th birthday. This was five weeks later. He said, Wes, I want to get tested again. I said, it's only been five weeks, Tom. He said, I don't care, but I want to know before my 90th birthday. I said, okay. So we tested him. Diabetes was gone. He had an A1C of 7.2. It dropped to a 6.2. 6.1 in five weeks. Why? Because he'd controlled the after-meal blood sugars with exercise and with the right diet. And that then be, those two became the real pillars that helped with his sleep, helped with everything else. Okay. He then went on to three months late, three months later, we checked him again. And now his A1C was 5.6. He'd, he'd reversed pre-diabetes as well. He'd gone from out of control diabetic to just pre-diabetic in five weeks, and now not even pre-diabetic three months later. That was that was essentially six years ago. He's still cranking it. 96 years old. He just had a birthday in July. We did testing. A1C, 5.1. It's been 5.1 for six years, for five and a half years. So, you know, never, never say that, you know what, I'm just too old for this. If you think you're too old for that, just think about Tom. He did it. It's not a question of age. It's a, it's a question of our willingness to take advantage of inform information and just apply it and get the results. And so, and so when we exercise right after meals lightly, when we participate in what I call the get sweaty exercises, which are some other time of the day, away from meal time, at least a couple hours later, where now we're exercising in a way to strengthen the muscles, tone the muscles, and that toning of the muscles dramatically improves insulin sensitivity of the muscle and the liver cells so they reverse their resistance, they become sensitive, and that insulin now is able to work very well. And now the pancreas doesn't have to produce nearly as much insulin. In fact, the pancreas now can produce as little as 10 or 20 percent of what it used to have to produce. So now it's not going to wear out. Now it's going to stay healthy. Now it can actually become healing and becoming more effective. And that's the power of introducing uh, the, these principles. So exercise and insulin resistance is, is very powerful. It, uh, how many of you read the book, Anatomy of an Illness? Anybody in here? It's an old book. Man, you, it's a wonderful book written by Norman Cousins uh, where he says, don't deny the diagnosis. If you've been recently diagnosed with diabetes or prediabetes or or with uh, mild cognitive impairment, or with high cholesterol, or triglycerides, or high blood pressure, or you're struggling with weight, whatever it might be, the, don't deny the diagnosis. Okay, defy the verdict. Okay? You have the potential to reverse this process. I, I'm not going to tell this story. Uh, let me jump into... Uh, oh, here, here's some of the complications of uh, poorly controlled diabetes that go beyond blood sugar control. They're basically uh, because you're not doing the things that undo the insulin resistance. Obviously, heart attack, number one, uh, the, the, uh, the, the gangrene, the, the peripheral ulcers, 
that are caused because we don't have any more sensation in our feet from the peripheral neuropathy, and so we end up injuring our foot, and we don't even know it, and it becomes infected, and a couple weeks later, somebody's talking about amputating our toe or our, or our foot or our leg. Uh, blindness, retinal detachment, uh, um, kidney dialysis, uh, all these things are 100% preventable even for people who have been diagnosed with diabetes or prediabetes. It's just, it just has to do with paying attention to, to the strategies. Okay, so diabetes is just that tip of the iceberg, which we call a metabolic mess, but it's really just the tip of the metabolic mess. There's many of us, most of us, already are in a pre-diabetic, and if not that, I would say the vast majority of us in this room have levels of insulin resistance, which is the core of the metabolic mess. And by applying the principles, again, that we're emphasizing in this eight-week program with Dr. Westerdahl, Diabetes Undone, it will address high blood pressure, atherosclerosis, depression, anxiety, headaches. Um, one of my good uh, friends and colleagues, Dr. Susanna Bick, who is a neurologist and a professor at at University of California at Irvine. And she, back in, back in, two, in 1990, she came to Loma Linda University as a neurologist from Europe and wanted to do additional training in lifestyle medicine. And so she became a doctoral student uh, at Loma Linda University uh, while I was on the fac full-time faculty there. And then I went into clinical practice and she said, Wes, can I shadow you? Can I spend some time with you at the Loma Linda Faculty Medical Group in Sun City, which was a retirement com uh, uh, community on the way down to San Diego? And, and so I said, sure. And so I, I was looking forward to learning from her as well. She's a neurologist. She's, um, she could teach me, and, and she, she certainly did, because as she sat and watched me work and see patients, and I'm bragging about how well this patient did in reversing their diabetes or, or blood pressure or cholesterol issues. And one day, she, after a couple of days of working with me, she said, she says, Wes, ha have you noticed something about headaches? And I go, yeah, everybody gets better. He goes, like, she goes, no, 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 no. I'm a neurologist. Headaches don't just get better. Okay, this is a major issue. There was, there was at least four patients the day before that had had headaches and they mentioned that to me, and I kind of like, yeah, good. Oh, your headaches are gone too. Everything's getting better. So, so I kind of minimized it. I was happy for them, but I didn't uh, fully appreciate the fact that neurologists struggle to help their patients with headaches, and here these patients, it was like a, a positive side effect of reversing their diabetes uh, or their blood pressure. And so I, so I said to her, she says, well, the main thing going on is that we're reversing the underlying cause of all these things. This insulin resistance that then causes what we call hyperinsulinemia, or an excess production of insulin by the pancreas, and that high insulin is necessary to try to control the blood sugar, even though it, it rarely does that properly, but that extra insulin is a huge metabolic burden that is the main reason we hold on to weight and we can't lose it. Why? Because insulin stores fat into fat cells. So if we're having a problem with that, we need, I would suggest that we test to, to, to see if there's an insulin resistance, high production of insulin, which means you have to measure insulin during a glucose tolerance test. So, so she was seeing this, and so she, as a neurologist, she said, she said, Wes, could, could, would you mind if I use this protocol in my doctoral research thesis. So I said, would I mind? I would love you to do this. This is great. So she worked with her, her, her research faculty at the, at the Loma Linda University and put together a, a study that looked at individuals, tested their insulin levels, people who had intractable headaches all the time, right? And, and basically, this is what she learned at the end of the study. When people address this very same strategy, that, that will be addressed in the Diabetes Undone program, the very same strategy, the headaches that these patients had, both intensity, duration, 
and frequency dropped an average of 75%. Intensity, duration, and frequency. This was such a powerful study that she published this in the, in the interesting medical journal called Medical Hypothesis. Like, wow, this is a whole new understanding of how headaches come about uh, through addressing this question with hyperinsulinemia. Um, my wife is not here at the moment. I can tell a story on her real quick. <laughs> uh, she had intractable migraine headaches for years until we figured out that she had this tendency, like I talked about during the afternoon Q&A, blood sugars crashing. When we initiated a protocol to stabilize her blood sugar so they didn't drop, migraines went away and never came back unless she wasn't following the protocol. So now we follow the protocol whether we're traveling or not. Nobody wants to have headaches, right? So, um, so basically there's so many factors that are involved here. Now, I, I promised earlier that I was going to talk about the relationship between insulin resistance and cancer and how one of the most profound uh, things that we can do to protect us against the most common cancers, colon cancer, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, um, skin cancer, um, th those, those most common cancers, is to reverse insulin resistance. When I first heard about this connection, I, I was kind of like, you know, I was incredulous. I was like, no, you know, and they, this, this, this has so much power to improve this and that and the other. It can't also be one of the most important things for cancer. So one of my physician colleagues, a, a family practice physician at Loma Linda, she actually clued me into this. And she said, he says, you know, there's a big relationship between insulin production because of resistance to insulin and breast cancer. I go, really? And so I, you know, I, I'm somewhat cynical, as I mentioned before. And so I said, I better, I'm going to find out for myself. So I got on the internet. This was, this was a long time ago. This is when we just had, you know, PubMed and, and it was like these 64K computers, right? <laughs> and, uh, and uh, I started looking up study after study of the relationship between excess insulin production and breast cancer. And after a couple weeks of doing this, I had 700 studies. This was 25 years ago. Yeah, this, yeah, this is 25, this is 1994, 93, 94. And, uh, and I, I, I finally I said, you know what? I'm wasting my time. I, sh I, should have, I should have accepted this as a fact after 10 studies. I didn't need 700 studies to document that. And yet, how, when's the last time you have heard that there's a relationship, a major relationship with insulin resistance and therefore the extra production of insulin to try to correct blood sugars and cancer? You don't hear about it, even though it's all over the medical literature. It's everywhere. And just uh, some years ago, the... Uh, the the journal of, uh, actually it was called Diabetes Care. It's, the, it's generally accepted to be the most prominent journal on diabetes management in the world. They published a study showing that current insulin users were 30 to 50% at greater risk of developing cancer. And man, did that create a lot of criticism in the diabetology community. You're like, oh, that's crazy. You know, you're, 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 you're kind of cause people to be afraid to take insulin. And so the study is the study. The study is saying if you're using insulin to, to make up the difference to try to control your blood sugar rather than addressing the cause, and your, and your insulin blood levels because of your insulin injections are running higher than they otherwise would normally be, for a metabolically healthy person, you're basically taking a growth hormone that promotes cancer in order to control blood sugars. Okay, now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying people should never use insulin. I'm saying that people should do the test to evaluate what the appropriate amount of insulin is 
and figure out other ways to control the insulin resistance because if you're compensating for insulin resistance by just taking more insulin, you're dramatically increasing your risk for everything. Does, so does that make sense? Yeah, and, and again, you don't hear this message very often, but that's the reality of the situation. And so, and so when this, this study, by the way, was only a two-year study. In two years' time, they noticed a 30 to 50% increased risk in cancer. And so they're saying, no, there's no possible way for colon cancers like that to happen in two years. And I'm thinking, you're missing the whole point. Yes, they probably had that earlier, but taking the extra insulin is what's driving the cancer, what's speeding it up, what's, what's promoting it. So, but it's, all, it's an initiator and a promoter. So uh, let's take a look at this. So, so, the, so this January 2013, a study, this was not a study with 10 people that was published in, you know, Tijuana. You know, this, this is a study of two, 25, almost 26,000 diabetics published in the most respected medical journal on diabetes in the world, where they said current insulin users were 30% more likely to be diagnosed with cancer. Men and women diagnosed, in addition to that, men and women who were diagnosed with diabetes for a more, that had diabetes for more than 15 years were 60% and 80% more likely to have cancer versus those who had had diabetes less than 15 years. If there was ever a call to action to undo diabetes, that would be it. You know, when the most dreaded, one of the most dreaded words in America and worldwide, or the most dreaded letter is that big C word, right? Cancer. Now, to be honest with you, that's no longer the most dreaded word. It's the A word, Alzheimer's. That's far more dreaded than cancer. Okay, people can come to grips with cancer. Alzheimer's is relentless. Okay, it, destroy, it, it doesn't take your life. Well, it does that too, but that's not the main point. The, more, the main point is that it destroys your life without taking your life right away. Okay, and that is also primarily driven by this same thing, Alzheimer's, right? We talked about that last night in detail. Alzheimer's is primarily the number one cause Metabolic driver of Alzheimer's is insulin resistance of the brain. We can prevent and reverse that. That, to me, is exciting. I mean, I, um, uh, the only reason I do this is because I'm so excited about how the possibilities. You know, I, I, I would hate to do medicine if all I'm doing is, is effectively diagnosing somebody and then just saying, I'm sorry, you know, now we know what your problem is, but... We have no idea, no idea what to do for you. We can give you some medicines that make you feel a little bit better. I would hate to do that. I, I, I would rather, rather do anything else than that. Okay, so, so the, this is just making you aware that the number one way that we can reverse our risk for cancer is, is to be on a comprehensive program that reverses insulin resistance. So this is true for um, uh, so this is true also for metabolic syndrome. Okay, so take a look here. So another big study, almost 39,000 uh, people with cancer uh, showed uh, a 25 to 61 percent increased risk of common cancers in those uh, with metabolic syndrome. In other words, you don't have to have diabetes for this to be the problem. Insulin resistance does not occur once you become diabetic. It occurs decades, many decades before somebody gets diagnosed with diabetes. And so that's why we need to uh, jump on it now. In fact, insulin resistance occurs decades even before we are diagnosed with prediabetes. Um, okay, 
Uh, now, so I, as I point out here, high insulin, but not normal levels of insulin reported as risk for cancer initiating and promotion. In other words, a type 1 diabetic who's taking a, 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 the amount of insulin necessary to correct their, the fact that they can't produce any, that's life-saving. That's good medicine. But, but to, to give a type 2 diabetic who's already producing 4 to 20 times the amount of insulin that they would normally need to control blood sugars and say, well, I know the answer. We'll just give more insulin. That, to me, is malpractice. That, to me, is, is, is not even understanding the pathology of the disease that you're supposed to be treating. Now, uh, the answer is address the cause. And by addressing the cause, now their insulin levels go way down, dramatically lowering the risk for all these conditions. Uh, so, um, so as a summary, we've established that the the strategies and the lifestyle medicine principles that, that powerfully undo diabetes and prediabetes also because they are focusing in on the fundamental aspects of improving the muscle and liver sensitivity to insulin, thus reversing insulin resistance, was also one of the best strategies to preventing and reversing headaches, for preventing and reversing the majority of common cancers. And I'm not saying it's the only cause of cancer. I'm absolutely not. I'm saying it's the fuel that fans the flames of cancer. That's what it is. And, uh, and by the way, the, the approach that we take to reverse the excess insulin production also is providing all these other nutrients and the removal of toxins and all the things that the body needs to start healing the process that can promote cancer as well. So you're getting all the benefits of restful sleep, of optimized hydration, of emotional health, of, of reprogramming the stress response, doing all those things. We've talked about how um, in fact, let me, let, me, let me talk a little bit more about this. Well, we've, we've clearly demonstrated that the, the primary risk factors for heart disease, for heart attacks or strokes, is actually this insulin resistance. Uh, Dr. David Eddy, a MD, PhD, who was professor at Stanford, uh, and I think maybe Duke University. I'm, uh, I have to look that up. He had a PhD in mathematics and an MD in clinical medicine. And it was a real interesting mix because he demonstrated, because of his knowledge of mathematics, he developed what's called the Archimedes research model, where he could put all this data into a National Institutes of Health supercomputer, and he could, he could adjust one risk factor at a time and see the, uh, uh, and, and do it on a person, a real person, but virtual. All their data is now in the computer, and change a risk factor starting at the age 20. In other words, completely normalize or optimize a risk factor starting it at the age of 20 all the way through age 60. And from that computer analysis, they determined which risk factor had by far the biggest impact of preventing heart attacks. They looked at smoking, they looked at high cholesterol, they looked at high blood pressure, they looked at uh, all the different risk factors. Guess which one risk factor basically rose to the top without any equal near it as the main cause or risk factor for coronary artery disease, for cardiovascular disease, was insulin resistance. So I know this concept of insulin resistance, you know, it's kind of hard to, so that's why I focused on it so much this weekend to help you understand. That's why we called it Diabetes Undone, because nobody would go to a program called Insulin Resistance Undone. Like, I go like, what? That's not for me. I'm not taking insulin. I'm not, I'm not even going to look into that program. And so, so we wanted to call it something that would draw attention 
and then help educate you that that's the tip of the iceberg. But in reality, all of us fall in that, that risk associated with that part of the iceberg that lies under the ocean surface. And by taking advantage of this information, we can dramatically increase our health.